Is rock and roll a style or a genre? What about jazz? How about classical music? What is classical music anyway? Is it the same as classical music? These are terms that represent large groupings of music that were created in a specific period of history with clearly defined musical parameters. For example, jazz is considered to have been created at the turn of the 20th century in New Orleans. And it uses blues scales, swing rhythms, and new instruments like the guitar and drum kit. A genre is a term that allows us to categorize and make sense of billions of songs and musicians that have existed throughout history. It is the system of musical taxonomy. But why does music and history evolve the way they do? Is it random or is there some type of pattern? Many philosophers of history have tried to find a formula to explain how history evolves over time. I'm going to explore two of these philosophers in an attempt to show how music has evolved over time. The German philosopher George Friedrich Hegel once said, History can be described as ideas in motion, with each age characterized by a dominant set of ideas, which produce opposing ideas and evolve into a synthesis of the old and the new. This is known as the historical dialectic. Now what does this look like? Well on this diagram of the historical dialectic you'll see a box in the top left saying thesis one. This is the dominant set of ideas that characterize the age. It is the zeitgeist of the age, as Hegel would describe it. The spirit of the times is the actual German translation. And it rules the age until Antithesis I emerges to oppose it. It is the opposing set of ideas that challenges the dominant set of ideas. And these two ideas, the dominant and the opposition, clash in conflict until eventually a resolution ha occurs, which is a form of compromise. and. That's when the synthesis emerges, synthesis one. This then becomes the new dominant set of ideas, the new zeitgeist, or in the diagram, thesis two. And this rules the age, it is the spirit of that times, until a new opposing set of ideas emerges. On the diagram, that is antithesis two. This opposing set of ideas challenges the dominant set of ideas, and there's a clash of conflict until a compromise is reached and synthesis two is the result of that. Synthesis two becomes thesis three, the new dominant set of ideas. So I think you can start to see a pattern here of how history uh, progresses on a linear pattern through time. Now Hegel thought that this all would eventually reach an absolute idea I don't know exactly what he meant by that, and I don't know if we're reaching an absolute idea, so I'm more drawn to the, the idea of the pattern, the historical dialectic, and that's what I'll be using to show linear progress in history and in music. Another German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, had an idea of the eternal recurrence. And basically, he outlined an idea where Reality is a repetitive pattern of epicycles that will continue on for infinity. He connected it to Imor Fati, the love of one's fate, and that the individual should embrace the role in these repetitive cycles. On the surface, Nietzsche appears to contradict the Hegelian concept of history, where history is linear, not cyclical. But I will try to use musical genres to show that music as a larger art form evolves in a linear pattern, Hegelian, but that the genres themselves are exhausted in a cyclical pattern, Nietzschean. I will also attempt to show that each successive genre runs through a similar historical process as preceding genres, and that this process is exhausted in smaller and smaller temporal epicycles as the linear process unfolds. So this timeline I've made here is to show the progress of 
the music made by Western civilization. I took it back to 100,000 BCE. Um, it's likely humans were making music at that time of skin drums and bone flutes and probably singing. And we don't know because it's prehistoric. So um, this leads into ancient civilizations and eventually Greek and Roman. When I was in university, they told me there was 48 Greek pieces that have survived and two Roman pieces. And they played me a Greek piece on an instrument called an aulos, which was a bit like a double reed, like an oboe. And it sounded pretty horrendous, but it was music nonetheless. And you can see how much time passed, 100,000 years between prehistoric music and Greek-Roman music. And then time just gets smaller and smaller in these epicycles as music evolves into the Byzantine era, medieval music, Renaissance, Baroque, 1600s, 1750, classical is basically 1750 to 1810, and then the Romantic era is the 19th century. Uh, this leads into the breakdown of tonality in the 20th century and the emergence of popular music styles like blues leading into jazz, country, rhythm and blues, rock, folk, dance, punk, electronic, hip-hop, and grunge. And you can see how the temporal epicycles, the period of time between each genre becomes smaller and smaller as each genre emerges and evolves. The history of Western classical music has major musical eras that can be defined by objective stylistic parameters that appear in the music of that era. Each of these eras also followed a growth period, followed by a peak that was followed by a decline. If one studies music history, they learn about how Mozart and Haydn were the epitome of the high Viennese classical style. This is an example of how each era or style has a peak of expression that best represents that era or style. It defines it. Western classical music progressed from the early Catholic Church through numerous stylistic evolutions until the genre itself reached a peak in the classical period and then declined through the Romantic era and the 20th century. The period of music known as classical music from 1750 to 1810, uh, the period of Mozart and Haydn, is called classical because it harkens back to the classic times of Greek and Roman culture, where artists strove for perfection of natural beauty. Their sculptures were meant to be realistic portrayals of natural beauty. Everything was symmetrical and in place, and it was perfect. And when you listen to the Mozart and Haydn music in early Beethoven, it's the same. Everything is perfect. Nothing feels out of place. If there's tension, it's resolved. It's, it's symmetrical and beautiful. And that's what the term classical means. It's a reference to Greco-Roman culture and the strive for the ideal. However, once a genre reaches its peak, it becomes self-aware. This is my theory. Once this happens, the genre begins to question itself. And all art from that moment on is reflective and referential because it cannot escape from the shadow of its predecessors. Once a genre becomes self-aware, it begins to die. We saw this in music in the case of Beethoven. For generations after, composers felt they were living in the shadow of Beethoven, and all music that was composed was compared and held to the standard of Beethoven. Thus begins the process of decline. And by decline, I do not mean to say that the quality of the music has declined in any way, but rather the life of the genre has begun to decline. The Romantics could not eclipse Beethoven, so they expanded on his chords, forms, instrumentation, orchestration, until there was hardly a tonality left. And then Schoenberg and the Second Viennese School finished the job and created the first atonal music with his 12-tone system, Serialism. Finally, it was natural to question the fundamental principles of music, as in John Cage's 4 minutes and 30 seconds, where silence is heard for the entirety of the piece. And this is when music evolved into conceptual art. 
If we apply the historical dialectic to the Western classical music timeline, we can see how each era functioned as the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. For example, the Romantic style functioned as the antithesis to the classical style, and it began to appear in Mozart and Haydn as they tried to expand their own forms and harmonic vocabularies and be more expressive of their individual situations. The Romantic and classical styles were synthesized, most completely in the music of Beethoven which still follows the rules of common practice period harmony, but is infused with an obvious personal identity. The Romantic style then became the thesis, as it became the mainstream, or status quo in Europe. It became the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. And all composers composed in a personal, expressive style, using common practice period harmony. Later, the Romantic style is challenged by the antithesis of the atonal style. And the early music of Schoenberg is an example of the synthesis of romantic and atonal styles. All musical genres follow this same pattern. It shows that there is an order to how music evolves and that all music is influenced by what it preceded it and that it will in turn influence what follows it. Other genres of music that have emerged throughout history have followed the same rise and fall trajectory that I've outlined with the Western classical music timeline. For example, if we look at the history of jazz music, we see that jazz grew from obscurity at the turn of the 20th century until it peaked in popularity in the swing bebop eras. Then it declined until today, where it could be argued no original jazz music is now made. Now I'd like to speak to authenticity of a musical genre or style. A musical genre and style can only be artistically authentic in its own time. If someone reproduces in a composition the stylistic elements of the Romantic era, that does not make them a Romantic composer. They are a neo-Romantic composer. The difference being, the authentic Romantic composer would be composing during the Romantic era. Any type of revival or commentary on a previous style is not an authentic artistic expression, but a technical reproduction. Once a style is removed from its time, it becomes burdened with all the memories that have become associated with that style within the realm of the knowledge of each individual. The history of rock and roll follows the same trajectory as jazz and classical music before it, except the evolution takes place in a smaller temporal epicycle over the course of 70-80 years. So we can see that uh, rock and roll developed from blues and country music into rhythm and blues in the 40s and 50s. And early rock and roll from the 50s, like Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley and Fats Domino, Little Richard, Buddy Holly, uh, led to a peak which was classic rock, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. And then everything after that is when the genre has become self-aware. So hard rock like Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith and ACDC and the Eagles and all that stuff uh, is the beginning of the decline of rock and roll. And some people think rock started to die in the 1970s, and I think this proves it. And uh, this led to further experimentation with rhythm and harmonic vocabulary and all types of other elements of music and non-musical elements uh, until there was a resurgence in the 90s with grunge. And then there's a whole bunch of fusion elements of rock where it's fused with other musical genres. But basically rock's been dead now for a couple of decades and there's been nothing original produced. And that's because it has declined uh, from its peak. Now I want to emphasize just once more that when I say it's declined, I don't mean to say the quality is declined. I'm not trying to say like Nirvana's music isn't as good as the Beatles or uh, Metallica isn't as good as Little Richard. Or something like that. I'm just saying that the trajectory of the genre has begun to decline after it became self-aware. All the periods leading up to it, it was discovering itself. And then once it becomes self-aware, it can't help but be referential and compare itself to the masters of the genre. And it has to find new ways to change itself until it eventually leads to a new genre of music. 